Hey, Kat. Hey, Jess. I've got a common scenario for you. Okay. You've got a long-running program that hasn't changed for years. You've been talking to your participants about how it's working for them, and you've started reviewing the current evidence to look at what changes you could make to make it more effective. The program has been running for ages but it's never been documented in any way um, there's no material that describes what the program does or why it does it um, and as well as wanting to update the program mm. you think it could be eligible for some additional funding oh yeah that sounds familiar mm -hmm. and one of the requirements of the extra funding that you want to go for is a program logic model and you've heard that logic models are a really mm. great way to think through and visually represent your program's aims, activities and intended outcomes. Okay, I'm with you so far. So then you look online and you find a program logic template. And this is where it starts to feel a little bit overwhelming, right? So it's hard to know where to begin and how to fill in all those boxes on the template. How do you know what makes a good program logic and how do you know uh, how to make it evidence informed? These are really good questions uh, and that's why we're going to step you through each stage of the process through every single one of those boxes so that you can develop your own logic model. By the end of this video you'll know how to write a problem statement, how to populate the inputs and outputs columns and of course you'll be able to identify short, medium and long-term outcomes. So when we say program logic or logic model in this video, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is a visual representation of how something like an intervention is supposed to work. You may have heard it called theory of change, results chain or chain of causation. You might need to do a program logic for your funder, but there's other reasons too. A program logic can help you to identify what inputs or investments are required for your program, what um, assumptions or other factors are likely to influence the success of your program and of course your outcomes. They can also be used as a great tool to monitor your program goals or for evaluation. You'll get more out of this video if you've got a program that needs a logic model or if you've got a logic model that needs updating. We've got a downloadable blank template that you can use to um, follow us through this presentation. You can just click the link and print yourself a copy. It might be handy to have some post-it notes and a pen as well. So Jess, in our scenario, we're developing a program logic to better understand what our program does, um, why our program does it, and how it's intended to work. Program logic serve real, a lot of different purposes, um, as you've just mentioned, but in our work with the community sector, we mostly use program logic as a tool for evaluation. Can you talk us through that, Jess? Sure. So it's really hard to evaluate a program or service if you don't know what the program's objectives are or how the program's intended to work. A logic model provides a foundation for evaluation because it makes it really clear what a program intends to do, how it intends to do it, and why. Yeah, and when you have a completed program logic, you can plan what you want to know from your evaluation and when to time it. There are hundreds of different ways to do a program logic, but at, at its most basic, it consists of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And when these three elements come together, we can really see how a project or a program is supposed to work. A helpful way to think about program logic and this concept is the if this, then that. So let's take a look at this Kellogg Foundation diagram. It explains the if-then concept really well. Here we can see that if you put resources into a program, then you can deliver your planned activities. And if you deliver your planned activities, then your participants will benefit in certain ways. Nice and simple. Though, what about the impact column, Jess? Is that a term that we would usually use? Yeah, like, that's a good question, Kat. I think the word impact can be a bit confusing. People use it in different ways to mean different things. Some people use it to mean long-term outcomes, and other people use it to mean long-term outcomes, but at a population or a community level, rather than long-term outcomes for um, program mm -hmm. participants. Yeah. You can see here that the Kellogg Foundation have used it to mean broader community level outcomes. Personally, I prefer the phrase long-term outcomes, but it's entirely up to the person creating the logic model about which terms they use. 
Another thing that comes down to personal preference is the actual template that you use. And there's really no right template here. So just choose one that works for you. Some programs have really complex pathways and then others are really straightforward. There are different templates that will suit different purposes. Maybe a funding body or your organization has a preferred option. We use a template from the University of Wisconsin because it's really simple, it's easy to complete and it's really un easy to understand once you've finished using it. If our template isn't a good fit, feel free to have a search online, look around and see and find one that suits your purposes. In our template, you'll see that there's 10 elements, a program objective, a problem statement, inputs, outputs, short, medium and long-term outcomes, assumptions and external factors. Some templates will have more fields and some will have less. The good news is that even if you're using a different template, the program elements are often similar. We're going to spend the rest of this presentation working through each of these fields and explaining what they mean. And feel free to pause the video at the end of each chapter so that you can complete the logic model as you go along. So, let's start with the problem statement. Excellent. We're going to work from left to right today. You can start with your outcomes and work backwards, but however you choose to complete your logic model, you should always do the problem statement first. Definitely. The problem statement describes the issue that you're trying to address. So, why are you delivering this program and what need is it intended to meet? In this way, the problem statement really uh, sets the scene for your program activities. So if you've done a needs assessment, this will inform your problem statement. Lucky for us, Jess has recently written a paper on needs assessment and you can access that paper by clicking the link on your screen. But if you haven't done a needs assessment, you'll really need to do some research and some thinking about the underlying causes of the issue, who experiences the issue and how they experience it. So how would you go about this, Jess? Another great question, Kat. <laughs> I would suggest an evidence-informed approach. And this gives me an excuse to show my favourite diagram. Yeah. <laughs> this was developed by our Emerging Minds colleagues and it clearly shows the three elements that make up an evidence-informed approach. So you've got practice expertise and this is the knowledge that we gain um, as practitioners, the knowledge that we gain through our work. Then you've got lived experience, and this is the expertise held by people who experience the issue that we're trying to address. And finally, in the last third, we've got research evidence, and this is what the research literature tells us about a particular issue. So out of these three different types of evidence, which one would you actually use to develop your problem statement? Yeah, look, you really need all three. So each of them give us a different but equally important perspective on an issue. Okay. So now we know where to look and who to talk to, what kinds of questions should we be asking to really better understand what the problem is? Well, we really want to be asking ourselves things like, what problem does the program seek to address? What do we know about the problem from the three parts of our evidence wheel? So research, practice and lived experience. Um, what are the causes of the problem? And what are the causes of those causes? <laughs> the causes of the causes. Okay, I think I've got that. But why would we want to drill that far down into the causes, Jess? Look, the example that I always think of here is around child neglect. So if we have high rates of child neglect in our community, and this is the problem that we want to address, we need to look at the cause of this issue. So neglectful parenting might be the immediate cause, but we know that neglectful parenting is often the result of other issues, things like substance misuse, um, mental health problems or financial stresses. So in order to be effective, an intervention that seeks to reduce child neglect would need to address these other deeper issues. Yeah, that's a really great example. Thanks, Jess. And it's important that we understand the, who the people are that we need to work with. So our target group or the groups that are coming to our intervention, who is actually affected by the issue and how are they affected? And um, we need to definitely do some consultation with people to really understand this. We also want to understand the consequences of the problem. So what is the impact on people and on communities if the problem isn't addressed? And finally, it's useful to know who else is working on a problem um, and what they're doing. So are there other local, regional, state or national initiatives that are seeking to address the problem? 
Yeah, because knowing who else is working on the issue means that you can identify possible partners to work with, but it also means that you won't be duplicating other really great work that's happening in your community. So there's a lot to do here for the problem statement, and there actually isn't a lot of space on the template to include all the information mm -hmm. that you do collect, that you do research. So we select developing um, a more comprehensive description of the problem statement that can sit alongside your program logic, but in a separate document. And here's one we prepared earlier. It's brief, isn't it? It is a little bit brief, but like you just said, we would usually have something a little bit more comprehensive that sits alongside the program logic. For your logic model, all you need is a few sentences to describe the problem. Um, but I'm curious, Kat, what do you think of this problem statement? Is there anything that you'd change? Listen, it's not a bad start, though I think it could be more specific. Uh, it doesn't really tell us the age of the children uh, and it doesn't really tell us what type of developmental milestones are not being met here. So are we talking physical, emotional, cognitive? What is it? I would agree with that. And for me, this problem statement is also missing a so what. So you mean it doesn't tell us why failing to reach developmental milestones is a problem for children? Yeah, exactly. I think it needs a bit more information about the impacts on children and families if the developmental milestones aren't met. That's fair. So I guess we still have a little bit more work to do here. Well, actually, I did draft up something that I think is better. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> so here's my new and improved version. It says... Children aged 0 to 5 in Blairtown are below the state average in meeting language, cognitive and social and emotional developmental milestones. Children that start school behind their peers on these key milestones can find it hard to catch up and this can have flow-on effects for their later um, academic success and work-related outcomes. What do you think? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, we're going to move on now from the problem statement. So if you want to pause here and do some work on your template, you can do that now. Let's take a look at the objective box at the top of the template. So as with everything in evaluation, objective is often used interchangeably with other terms. So you might call it goal, aim or outcome. But whichever term that you're using to describe this, uh, what we want here is really a concise sentence or two that describes what the program is trying to achieve. Most people are pretty clear about what their program objectives are. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely, in my experience. Um, and, it's, and this has often already been done. So people might have um, an objective or something like that recorded in a project plan, in a funding submission, or it might be on some promotional material somewhere. And what's great about the objective is that it really anchors the program logic. And you should be able to see the connection between the objective um, and between the other parts of your logic model. What do you mean by that, Jess? <laughs> I just mean that you should be able to really clearly see how the activities that you're doing in the program will contribute to your objective. So feel free to pause here and write in your program objective if you have one. We're now going to focus on populating the inputs and outputs columns. Um, let's start with inputs. So inputs are the resources that you allocate to, ad to address the problem identified in your problem statement. What are some common inputs here, Jess? Well, there's all the tangible things that you need to actually run your program or service. So things like funding, skilled staff, physical spaces, resources, so things like your toys or arts and crafts materials, um, and of course your program manual or guidance. Then you've also got non-material things such as research evidence about what works or mm. best practice principles. And then, of course, you've also got things like, um, like our relationships with partner agencies. So you might be relying on them to refer people into the program or they might, make an, uh, they might be making in-kind contributions to yeah. the program. As well as this, we've got um, our existing relationships with the community. So we might have a staff member who's been working with a particular community for a really long time, and those existing relationships could be crucial to the success of a program. That's a really great list to get us started. I guess I'd also be adding in their organisational infrastructure. So that's just things like management, payroll, OH&S, uh, essential organisational functions that you need in order to run your service or program. So 
You might want to pause here and fill out your inputs column before we move on to the next thing. And remember, you only want to include the inputs that you need for your specific program, not every resource um, at your disposal. So now let's move on to outputs. Outputs are the activities or services that you intend to deliver. We also have a second column here for participation. But we're going to start with activities. So we like to distinguish between core activities and non-core activities. Core activities are the things that you do that directly contribute to the results that you're expecting from your program. Another way to think about this is that these are the things that you need to do if you want to see outcomes. So examples from our sample template are information sessions, role playing, teaching behaviour management techniques um, and mindfulness sessions. And what about non-core activities, Kat? So it can be a little bit tricky to distinguish between our core and non-core activities. And that's just because there's usually so much going on in our programs and going into our programs and services. Say for example, that in a group parenting program, one particular facilitator decides to educate the group about healthy eating. Um, on the one hand, you know, there's likely to be some benefits from promoting healthy foods, but on the other, it doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with changing parenting practices, which is the goal of the program. So, and because it's only done by one facilitator and it's not a consistent part of the program, we wouldn't really consider it to be a core program activity. If you have something like a program manual, it will be more straightforward to populate this column. If you don't have a manual, you might need to go through a process to identify the core program activities. And one way to do this would be by having a brainstorming session with the staff who are involved in the program. Yeah, and it can really help to group similar activities together too. What do you mean, Kat? <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit confusing. But, you know, say you're running something like a play group and you have lots of different games. You don't necessarily want to list every single potential game that you might be playing in that play group. So you might group them together and call it something like play-based activities. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and you can come back to review your outputs column after you've identified your outcomes. Sometimes when you've identified your outcomes, it makes it much easier to see whether you've missed some activities or whether you've included some non-core activities. Great advice, thanks Jess. So here's an example from our program logic. You can see that this program logic keeps it simple and including the core activities helps to tell your program story. If you overcomplicate it or add unnecessary items, it will be harder for people to read and to make sense of your program logic. Now onto the participation column. So this describes who will actually be reached by your program. The key thing here is to clearly define the program's target group. So for example, if you're delivering a program to children, specify their age, or is there criteria for attendance? Add that in too. But what about terms like vulnerable or disadvantaged? We see this a lot in program logics that we review. Are these terms okay to use, Kat? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I guess terms like disadvantaged and vulnerable are not very strengths-based, but apart from that, they're, they're not very specific. What do they actually mean when we say those terms? So do you mean people who are experiencing isolation or are they unemployed or experiencing financial hardship? It's really hard to know from those broad terms what we mean. Mm -hmm. Um, and the participation column should be consistent with the target group that you've identified in your problem statement and you should be able to explain why this target group is the priority for the program. And of course, if there's multiple target groups, list all of them. Okay, so here's an example. This program is for children aged 0 to 5 and their families. It's particularly focused on families from a low socioeconomic background and those with a history of engagement with the justice system. Um, targeting the program to families with those specific needs means that those needs can actually be met. If you're developing a program logic alongside planning a new program, this process will be really helpful. Delivery of the program will be much smoother if you can first identify your target group and their needs. Mm. For example, to meet the needs of your target group, you might need to run the program at a specific time or in a particular location, or your target group might need language interpreters or have accessibility needs. Yeah, and it can also help to prioritise your resources so that they are being used to reach the people that are most in need. And let's not forget that defining the target group helps with evaluation. Mm. 
For example, we might want to measure whether the program is reaching its intended participants, so we need to know exactly who those intended participants are. Yeah, and knowing who the target group is helps us to understand who the program is working for when it comes to measuring outcomes in our evaluation. That's right. There are so many reasons for doing this work up front. And that's it for outputs. Pause here to complete the participation column or continue on to hear about outcomes. Thinking through and writing down outcomes is a little bit tricky because there is a lot to consider. Mm. The first thing to remember is that for our purposes, an outcome is a change that's intended to happen for people as a result of an intervention. In my role supporting service providers to develop program logics, there is often an impulse across the board to label items about program attendance and program satisfaction as outcomes. And while I completely understand that impulse, you know, we want participants to enjoy the program that we're offering them and we want them to keep coming back so that they can actually see benefits. Um, but these items really belong in the outputs col column or possibly in the assumptions box. And this is because they don't always tell us about the actual effectiveness of the program. Is, would you agree with that, Jess? Yes and no, Kat. Look, I think it's often important to increase participant satisfaction and this can definitely help us to achieve our other outcomes. But um, yeah, I think I agree. So I don't like to include these as outcomes because most of the time they're not what our program is ultimately trying to achieve. So for example, if our outcomes are around improving parenting skills and behaviour, having great attendance and participant satisfaction is important. But it's not why we're running the program and it doesn't tell us if our participants are actually increasing their knowledge about parenting and if they're implying the information that they learn in the program yeah. to their lives. Yeah, exactly. And people could be coming back to the program because, you know, their friends are attending or because they're mandated to. And just because people aren't actually enjoying the program doesn't mean that the program isn't being effective. So I suppose it really comes down to what the purpose of your program is. And if engagement is a really impo important part of your program, so say you're running a community development program, then you might have attendance and engagement as a short-term outcome. But if the program is about strengthening parenting behaviour or children's language and cognitive development, then you really want your outcomes to be focused on, you know, the changes around uh, skills, knowledge and behaviour, specifically related to those outcome areas. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Now, I won't go through all of these, but you can see here in our playgroup example, the short-term outcomes are increases in skills, knowledge and confidence. So parents are increasing their skills and confidence to provide mm. play-based activities for their child, and parents are increasing their knowledge of developmental milestones and support services. Children are also increasing their social skills and parents are increasing their social networks. So you can see the if-then relationship between mm. outcomes happening here. If parents increase their skills and confidence to provide stimulating play activities for their child and they increase their knowledge of child development in the short term, then we can expect that parents will be more skilled and empowered to support their child's development in the medium term. Yeah. And as you can see from this example, short-term outcomes are generally changes in skills, knowledge and confidence, and medium-term outcomes are generally changes in behaviour that flow on from your short-term outcomes. Mm -hmm. And long-term outcomes take much longer to manifest. They're really distant from the intervention in mm -hmm. terms of time and in terms of attribution. So it's unlikely that one eight-week program alone is going to cause children to have enhanced wellbeing and development. No, that's right. But we can surely expect them to contribute to those longer term program outcomes, right? Definitely. And there should be research evidence that we can draw on to demonstrate how our short term and our medium term outcomes will contribute to our longer term outcomes. Okay. So we're going to move on to the tricky part now, which is identifying and writing your outcomes. And this is really one of the biggest challenges we see in the work that we do with developing program logics, because there are just so many possible outcomes and identifying the right ones from your program can just be a little bit difficult. So generally speaking, you've got outcomes, you've got outcomes, you've got outcomes, but then you've got outcomes that are realistic, specific and measurable, important, supported by evidence and written as change statements. What does 
that actually mean, Jess? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk you through it. So realistic means that the change is likely to happen as a result of the intervention. So the outcomes are likely given the available inputs and activities and the scale of the problem. Also, the outcomes are likely to happen within the specified time frame. Okay, so say you're delivering a mother-child relationship building program for women who have experienced domestic violence. While you might have a discussion about safety, you couldn't realistically expect to see a reduction in violence as a result of the program. And this is because fathers and other members from the community aren't involved in that program. Exactly. So a realistic outcome would be that women have improved relationships with their children. And specific and measurable means being specific enough so that you can tell if the outcome has been achieved or not. So increased parenting skills is one that we see quite a lot. Is that specific enough? You could definitely be more specific. Something like increased skills to engage in play-based activities would be better. Yep. Important means that the outcome should influence the problem that the intervention is designed to address um, and that's the problem that you've identified in your problem statement. So if a program's problem statement says that a particular community has high rates of child neglect and the program is intended to help remedy this by addressing parental mental health mm. and substance misuse, then child self-esteem would not usually be an important outcome. No. And that's because this is not central to fixing the problem or to meeting the program's aims. So here, a reduction in substance abuse would be an example of an important outcome. Supported by evidence means that there's research evidence to say that the outcomes are likely to happen as a result of mm. the activities and the short-term outcomes are likely to lead to the medium-term outcomes and your medium-term outcomes are likely to lead to your long-term outcomes. Yeah, so the connections that we're making in our program logic are firmly grounded in research evidence. Um, and when your program's informed by evidence, you're really less likely to make unrealistic or untested assumptions about how the program should work. Exactly, Kat. I often see program logics for single session seminars that provide information on a particular issue. Yeah. And logic models for these types of programs often suggest that participants will change their behaviour based on what they learn in the seminar. And I suppose the problem with this particular example is that it's not supported by research evidence. So we know that it takes more than just giving people some information about a particular issue to influence their behaviour. And finally, outcomes should be phrased as change statements. So will things increase, decrease or stay the same? And this one's about how your outcomes are worded. So perhaps you might want to see an increase in skills or knowledge or a reduction in violence accepting attitudes. It's probably worth mentioning the timing of outcomes, Kat. I think that's a good idea, yeah. So we include timeframes in our program logics because it helps us to identify what outcomes to measure and when. If you have a long-term project or if you see participants irregularly, your timeframe for short-term outcomes might be when you first expect to see participants benefiting from the program. Mm. So for example, you might say something like after six visits. So you should be guided by your experience and by the structure and design of the program. You can also refer to research literature um, on the specific problem or intervention for insights on timing. Program logics are living documents, so if you get the timing wrong, you can always go back to them and move things around. Mm -hmm. um, we usually expect to see medium term outcomes after the program has ended. Yeah. So, for example, something like after six or 12 months, although this would be different for different types of programs or services. And what about long term outcomes, Kat? Yeah, so the time frame for these is often several years down the track. Uh, Long-term outcomes should flow on from your medium-term outcomes, but they can be affected by many different outside influences. Mm -hmm. And the time frame you choose should really reflect the length of time that's needed to, um, for those outcomes to be realised. So if you are intending to influence or improve child development, you might need to allow several years for those outcomes to be achieved. And if you're worried that you won't be able to measure long-term outcomes in your evaluation, rest assured that many programs or interventions never do. Mm. And this can be okay depending on how long the program has been running. But even if it's too early to measure your long-term outcomes, your logic model should show the steps to how these would be achieved. The short-term and the medium-term outcomes in your model are a way of checking if you're on track. 
And once you've established time frames, just go back to your program logic and check to see whether the outcomes you've written can be realistically achieved. Uh, you might need to move some things around at that point. And you can watch our video on outcomes measurement for more information. If you haven't put time frames and outcomes into your template yet, pause here and add yours in. Um, and we suggest using post-it notes for your outcomes so that you can move them around if you need to. It's just impossible to get everything right the first time. Assumptions. Jess, it's your absolute favourite topic. It is. <laughs> Assumptions are super important because they make the logic part of a logic model more explicit. And because assumptions really occupy a very small, uh, tiny space on the program logic template, they're often not given the time and energy that they deserve, and that's really a mistake. If we don't identify and check our assumptions, this can prevent a program from achieving its outcomes, or it can make it really difficult to make sense of the evaluation results if they're not clear. So identifying assumptions, again, it's a really valuable exercise. So, Jess, can you tell us exactly what assumptions are? Sure. So, assumptions are the conditions surrounding our program that we want to be in place for the model to work. Um, can you maybe explain that one again? <laughs> All right. Look, bear with me. Assumptions are things like people will turn up to our program, the time and location will be accessible to participants, the staff will implement the program material. So these are the things that we assume will be there and these things need to be there for the program to work. When planning a program, we make assumptions in a whole lot of different areas about our program, the people involved and how it will work. Yeah. So we might have assumptions about the problem or issue, about the resources or staff, about the way the program will operate, about the participants who are going to come to our program um, and about the activities and their connection with outcomes. So here's the assumptions from our playgroup logic model. You can see here that we've got assumptions about attendance, assumptions that the activities will be engaging, about staff and low staff turnover and about ongoing relationships with partner organisations. Okay, that definitely makes much more sense. But identifying assumptions, it's not an easy process, is it? It's really not. Identifying assumptions is a process of interrogating our own beliefs about the way things work. So what do we know um, and what are we assuming and how do we know what we know? Do we know something because our colleague told us in the tea room or do we know because we read it in a research summary? And if we read it in a research summary, how do we know that it's true and relevant in our context? So looking at your program logic, why do you believe that the program will work this way? How do you know that the activities will lead to the outcomes? We suggest brainstorming your assumptions with your colleagues if you can, because having multiple perspectives means that as a group, you'll be able to identify assumptions that you wouldn't have been able to come up with by yourself. Our programs and services are of course influenced by the environment um, in which they're delivered. So in program logic language, we call this external factors. Um, and I'm talking about things like economic, political, cultural, historical, social. Uh, these things can all have an impact on our program and the way it's delivered and the outcomes that we want to achieve. Yeah, and understanding the external fact factors that influence our interventions can help us to understand and contextualise our outcomes. If something isn't working as expected, this might be because something in the external environment is affecting our program. Yeah. So perhaps transport in a region has changed and our program is no longer accessible. Or perhaps demand for a counselling service has gone up um, and all of a sudden we've got a waiting list. So we might think that, you know, there's an increase in mental health problems in the community or that, you know, word's getting out about how great our program is. But it could actually be that a service in a neighbouring suburb has closed down. Mm. So understanding external factors helps us to think through the causes of changes that we might be seeing and helps us to understand what else, apart from our programs and services, um, is affecting our participants and our communities um, and the outcomes that we're working towards with them.
Yeah, and like assumptions, it can be hard to recognise the external factors that influence our programs or services and the outcomes that we want to achieve. So you might already have a pretty good idea of what the external factors are um, that interact with your program now or that are likely to in the future, but it can be beneficial once again to kind of talk these things through with other people involved in the program. And Jess, I know that you've had a bit of experience kind of working through and identifying external factors. Uh, are there sort of ways um, that work really well to do this? Yeah, look, I think one way that is really useful is um, if you've got good relationships with participants that are attending your program or service. This means that you can ask them about any changes that you might see. Um, so community members and staff as well that are really well grounded in the communities that they're in are excellent sources of expertise about local contexts. Yeah. And identifying external factors, they help us to understand what you might be seeing, the changes that you might be seeing, but also another reason to do that is so that you can put some really great risk mitigation strategies in place. And here's some potential external factors. So on our list here, we've got funding and contracts, availability of other services, We've got changing community demographics, new research and evidence, um, and of course, government policy. Can you think of any other examples, Kat? Um, I guess, you know, we've been working around the country and some of the rural and more remote services that we've worked with have really talked about the changing availability of transport in their example. You know, an airline stopping or starting, flights to their region, or, you know, another thing that people have spoken about is the media. So if there's a particular issue that becomes, you know, kind of a bit of a hot topic or a media, there's a media storm around it, it can really influence the context in which we're working. Yeah, thanks Kat, they're good ones. Uh, and that's it for assumptions and external factors. So you can pause here uh, if you'd like to add in your own. So Jess, I think we've run out of boxes to complete. <laughs> we have. <laughs> By now, you'll either have a draft program logic ready to workshop with your team, or you'll have some ideas about how to develop or update a logic model. Wherever you're up to, we've got some final suggestions for bringing your program logic together and making it the best it can be. Do you want to begin, Kat? Sure, I'd love to. So firstly, the more stakeholders that you can include in developing your program logic, the better it will be. If you consult and co-design with program logic with your staff, um, funders or with partner agencies, people from the community, it will more accurately represent the program and it will be a much stronger because you've really um, done all that work to identify more assumptions and you have a more comprehensive understanding about what the outcomes might be. Yeah, I agree. Involving people in developing um, a logic model can also increase buy-in for monitoring and evaluation activities. So there's many different reasons to bring people together. Uh, but you don't have to do this um, in like a program logic type no. format. You could just have a discussion with a group of participants about what they think the likely outcomes of a project would be. Yeah, and I'd also add that program logic, you know, they're a living document. So um, try not to put it away in a drawer and never think about it again. I know, you know, we've probably all been a bit guilty of that in the past, but refer to it throughout the life of the program and update it as things change. So would you consider setting maybe something like a regular kind of review period or some dates around that, Jess? Yeah, look, I think that could be helpful. Um, but I think what's most important here is that we keep the program logic aligned with the program. So we often change our programs for really good reasons. We might be out there delivering our program and some of the content just isn't working for mm. participants, so we change it. Um, or we might have made some other changes to the program structure to make it more accessible. Um, and these are all really good, sensible changes to make. We need the programs to work for our participants. But it's important that our logic model stays up to date with these changes yeah. um, while it also remains a useful guide to what the program, to exactly what we're doing in the program and to what we hope that we achieve through our outcomes. Yeah, it definitely does. And having a program logic that reflects the program is really helpful when there are staff changes or if you're preparing a funding application or you want to adapt or scale up the program. Yeah. Um, I'd also make the point that while a program logic is a tool that is really useful for designing and planning an evaluation, it doesn't replace a good evaluation design. Yeah, that's a really great point. And, you know, if you're interested in evaluation design, we've developed a lot of resources around this. So just have a look on our website and if you're interested. 
So the final thing to consider is what the program looks like as a whole. Um, is it truly logical? Are the inputs suitable for the activities? Do the inputs, outputs and outcomes come together and make sense? Um, and is there research, experience or evidence to suggest that the outputs will lead to the outcomes? We've put together a checklist so that you can review your program logic and identify anything that isn't quite working and you can download that by clicking the link here. Okay, so we've made it to the end. Whew. I know. <laughs> Do you want to just quickly maybe summarise what we've covered today, Jess? I'd love to. So a program logic makes the theory behind a program or project visible. Outputs are activities or services delivered and outcomes are changes that happen for children, young people and families as a result of our activities. Identifying assumptions and external factors is a really important part of logic models. Logic models should be developed and checked with program staff and stakeholders and of course our logic models should use evidence, all three types of evidence, to connect the outputs and outcomes. Thanks Jess and thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, please don't forget to check out our evaluation resources on our website.